Good evening and welcome. It's good to see everybody out this evening. We have guests with us. We want you to know that we are happy that you've come our way and certainly invite you back every opportunity uh, to be with us uh, either on Sunday or on Wednesday as we gather together in the middle of the week to focus our attention on God, kind of put away those thoughts and cares of the world and center ourselves on God and His blessings to us and His Word to us and our relationship with one another. I'm glad that I am here. I know that you are glad that you are here as well as we seek to encourage, edify one another in our spiritual lives. Uh, before we get started, and uh, I am not sure who's the, the prayer leader. Nick is our prayer leader tonight, and he'll start us off here in just a moment. And Byron will be leading our singing tonight. Before we do that, though, a few announcements to make. Uh, first of all, uh, Ann Rayburn's mother, Cleta, and Marie Burton's sister, Billy, uh, have both been moved to rehab. And uh, Marie tells me that her sister will stay in rehab until the 16th as they... Uh, bring her down from some medications that she is on, and then she will go uh, back to the um, memory care unit where she was uh, before she uh, had her difficulties. Uh, the Jasper's granddaughter still having AFib problems, even though she did uh, get the uh, pacemaker, uh, but she's still going home to Georgia Sunday, and so. Uh, the Jaspers, of course, are worried about that, so be sure and remember uh, the daughter, uh, the granddaughter and the Jaspers in your prayers. Uh, Donna Parker's aunt had her surgery and came through that uh, evidently amazingly well and is now home. The news on her brother, not so good. He remains in the hospital, and um, they, they really need to operate on him, but... Um, they cannot at this time because of his overall health condition. So be sure and be mindful of him as his health struggles. Uh, there is a gospel meeting at the Westwood Village Church in Sherman beginning Sunday. Be mindful of that if you want to take a trip up, up the way to Sherman for that. Uh, also remember our singing uh, on May the 4th. And um, we're looking forward to that. Uh, those are always uh, edifying times that we spend together in that. We appreciate the work that Richard does in putting those things together. Um, that's all the announcements that I have. Yes, ma'am. Okay, the Greens are going to be in Colorado. I suppose everyone's heard that they are moving uh, to Colorado, so they're going to be leaving and be gone over the weekend through Tuesday and doing some house hunting. So uh, we hope that doesn't go very well and that you, <laughs> you, you can't find a place to move and you have to stay here. Anything else that we need to announce? Yes, Ron. Okay, Robert Williams, um, he, he has severe diabetes and that works on him in a number of ways, his blood pressure, his, um, uh, well, just a whole, whole number of ways that, that, that it affects him and going through a very difficult time at this time, so be sure and keep him in your prayers. Anything else? Nick, start us off, brother. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you would help us to study tonight, that we would learn more about your word, and that we would learn more about your will, and that we would be edified, that we, we, that we would become more knowledgeable, and so that we can go out after tonight and continue to preach your word and to continue to be faithful to you. We're thankful that you let us all get here safely together. And we ask that you would be with us and that you would bless us. And we pray this prayer in our Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Take my life of Father Coleman. Take my life of Father this evening, I want to turn to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2. Um, the daily Bible reading is doing Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther for the month of April. The reading has gone through uh, Ezra already in the rebuilding of the temple on Mount Zion, and now uh, Nehemiah, the, the attention turns to the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, Nehemiah occurs about 70 years, or at least gets rolling, about 70 years after the completion of the temple there in Jerusalem. And um, it begins in Medo-Persia, where Nehemiah is the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes, and he hears how things are going in Jerusalem as far as the, the city is concerned. And it seems that other than the temple, the, the city remains in ruins 70 years, and they are still uh, in ruins. The wall is broken down. Nehemiah, loving the people of God and loving the city of God, the things of God, is devastated by this news. And um, he petitions Artaxerxes to allow him to go back, take, take some people with him, go back to... Uh, Jerusalem and do the work of rebuilding the walls. And Xerxes allows him to do that and he comes to Jerusalem and he sees the horrible state that the walls are in and so he, uh, he, he looks at it during the night kind of uh, in secret. He, he doesn't want the enemies of God's people which are numerous and powerful to know that he is there and what he is doing. And so he does that at night, but he comes the next day to the people. And he tells them that uh, God is going to be with them as they rebuild this wall around this city. And I love the, their reaction to it. He says in verse 18, I told them of the hand of my God, which has been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he has spoken to me. So he says that Artaxerxes is behind this. He, he's okay with it and helping with it. More important than, than that, God is with them as they do this work. And here's their reaction. Let us rise up and build. Don't you love that? That is a wonderful statement. Let us rise up and build. And then it says, they set their hands to this good work. I tell you, I, I read that and I am encouraged by the example of the people, not only of Nehemiah, but the people there in their reaction to Nehemiah, the, the, the zeal with which they face this. And I wonder where have these people been for 70 years, you know? Seventy years they've lived in, in these shambles, and it takes someone like Nehemiah to come to them and say, listen, this is not what God wanted for you. 
You're in danger. This is humiliation. And it needs to change. And God can help you to change it. And it is at that encouraging message that, that the people realize then the danger they are in. They realize uh, what a humiliating thing living in these shambles is. And they put their minds and their hearts and their hands to the work of rebuilding that, that, those walls. And that's what the book of Nehemiah is about. Ezra is about rebuilding the temple. Nehemiah is about rebuilding the walls. So I think about that. I think, you know, God has called us to be kinds of Nehemiahs, to go out into a world that's broken by sin and to offer a solution to that. That's what the presentation of the gospel is all about. The gospel starts with bad news, and that is that the world is lost in sin. The walls of the world are broken down, if you will. The world is in shambles because of sin. But there is a solution to that, and the solution to that is reconciliation to God. We're going to talk about, uh, and, and I think we'll get to it tonight, in our um, study of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says that's what he was doing. He was reconciling the world to God. The world was broken and he made it his life's ambition to let the world know that it was broken and that the world didn't have to stay broken. People could come to God and they could, with, with God's work, th their lives could be rebuilt. They could receive the forgiveness of their sins and the renewed hope of eternal life. That's our job. Those of us who have experienced uh, the rebuilding of our lives, the reconciliation that we have with God, our job is to go and to tell others what God has done for us. And if you've not yet had your life rebuilt by God, if you've not yet enjoyed that reconciliation, your responsibility is seen in those people to whom Nehemiah spoke. Your responsibility is to say yes. That reconciliation is what I want. The end of the humiliation, the end of the pain, the end of the sorrow, the end of the death, the brokenness that sin brings to our lives. To so say I want the end of that. And so I'm going to allow God through His Son, Jesus Christ, to rebuild my life. Is that you tonight? Is that a decision that you need to make in whatever way you are broken to allow God through Jesus Christ to heal that brokenness? If sin has broken you, Jesus Christ died on a cross so that you could be reconciled to God and have that hope of eternal life. If your life is, is just broken, Jesus continues to be that source of repair for your life. How can we help you tonight to repair the brokenness if you're broken and you know you're broken and you need our help, let us know how we can help you by coming forward right now while together we stand and sing. I can hear my Savior calling.
2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul in this very personal letter to the Corinthians uh, is speaking to them of the importance of the work that he is doing and why he is so committed to the doing of this work and uh, what it is that is really the motivation for his doing this. And he continues that thought in chapter 5. He talks in in the end of chapter 4 and verse 16 uh, about the reason he doesn't lose heart in the things that he is doing. And he says, even though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Uh, his outward man was perishing. He's on up in years at this time, and these have been hard years, as we're going to see in chapter 11 and all the things that he went through. And as we noted last week, no doubt this had taken quite a toll on him so that people were saying about him, his presence is weak. And I suspect it was very weak. And yet he says, even though this this body is decaying, it is passing away, yet not so with the inner man. The inner man, he says, is being renewed day after day after day. And so the outward person gets weaker, is passing away, but the inner man, the weaker the outer man gets, the stronger the inner man gets. And it's it, that, that's kind of the, the well, he, he, in verse 18, he says, we're looking at the things which are seen, or not looking at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so Paul, not only is he looking at his physical condition, understanding that whatever the problems are, those are temporary problems, that's the way he's approaching his whole life. And all of these things that, that are on the outside, uh, you look in, in the book of Philippians and what he says uh, about uh, all of the things that he had in, in Judaism and, and all these things that he was willing to give up. He recognizes those things as worth giving up because they're temporary things. And he says there in Philippians, he gives up the the temporary things so that he can have the eternal things, so that he can have the resurrection of the dead. And so with that thought in mind, he begins chapter 5, which which is a continuation of that idea as he compares the physical life with the eternal life. He says... For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Okay, so he's making a comparison here between a tent and a house. Um, what, what, what is the, what's the, what does, what does a house have that a tent does not have? Permanence. I think that is the main idea. It is, it is the permanence of the thing. And he said, when he says this, this that we're in right now, this fleshly body, is a tent. It is a temporary dwelling. Now, Paul would have known something about tents, wouldn't he? What was his secular job? Tent maker. He was a tent maker. And uh, when he had come to Corinth, he was engaged in the activity of making tents when he first came there with Aquila and Priscilla. And I suspect there was the need for a lot of tents because it was my understanding that when the, um, when the Isthmian games uh, came, came to town uh, every four years and then the, the Olympics every four years, uh, there were tent cities built because, you know, kind of like the Olympics today, where you have tens of thousands of people that come to a, a city and, and there, there has to be somewhere for them to stay. Well, in this day and time, they, they build a bunch of hotels that become ruins when the Olympics are over with. 
uh, most of them. Uh, then they, they made tent cities. And with the understanding that this was not where these people were going to remain for the rest of their lives. They were only going to be here a week or two. And so that's all that they needed was this temporary shelter. This is what we're living in here. This, this thing, it's a tent. It's a temporary shelter. He said, but we're looking for a house. We're looking for a permanent structure that does not fade away. Remember in verse 17 of chapter 4, he had talked about uh, the affliction that had come and it's this momentary light affliction. And he says, we can endure that when we compare it to the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And so in chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, I'm living in a tent. This is not home. I'm headed home. I'm looking for an eternal dwelling. He's going to call it, a, uh, or he calls it there, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He's looking for a heavenly home that God has built for those who are faithful to him. And so in verses 2 through 4, he says, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. In this we groan. Figuratively, and a lot of times, literally. Any of you people that are my age or older, you ever groan? <laughs> like every time you get out, out of the easy chair, you're groaning. Well, that's this body wearing out. And it's a, it's a groan-worthy process that we go through. You younger people don't know, you think you've grown, but... Um, you know, when you, when you pull something, you may groan. Uh, when, you, when you break something, you may groan. Getting out of bed, you groan when you get older. Uh, when nothing has happened other than the body is just worn down. Well, they did that in Paul's time too. They did some groan. I'm sure Paul given the things that he, he describes himself in chapter 11, I have no doubt but that he did a lot of literal groaning. But he says that's what this life is about. In this life, we groan. Not principally the literal. Principally the figurative. We're groaning because we're desiring something else. Now, the older we get, I think the more we ought, we ought to, to really cherish those promises that are made in, 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 that He made in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the inglorious uh, giving way to the glorious, the weak giving way to the strong, and all of that that He describes the difference between this human existence and the heavenly existence, the human body and the heavenly body. Um, but he says what we're desiring, we're, we're groaning because we're desiring to be clothed. And here he uses another uh, metaphor. Um, not only are we tinted, but we are um, not very well clothed, he says, in this life. Earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. That's 1 Corinthians 15. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 is all about. There in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul talks about the resurrection of the dead, he says it's not with, you know, it, it, the body is going to be raised, but it's not going to be this flesh and blood body that will be lowered into the ground and will decay. He said it will be raised a spiritual body. 
And that's what we are desiring. That's what uh, we are seeking. To be clothed, not with a body of flesh and blood again that goes through the same um, process of, of degeneration, but with a body that, that is fit for eternity. Um, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. Verse 3. Our desire, you know, when, when we die, what happens to the soul, according to Ecclesiastes? Where does it go? Turns to God who gave it. What happens to the body? Turns, it goes, returns to the dust of the ground. What Paul is saying here in this passage is that division between soul and, and body where soul is now unclothed, that's not our goal. To, to, to be unclothed in soul. Our goal is to be clothed with an eternal body. With a house. Um, I think I've, I've said it before, if not, if I have, just use it as reinforcement. If not, then learn it for the first time. Um, I think that we don't place near enough emphasis on the resurrection of the body. What the Word of God seems to tell us is that we are not complete without our bodies. That that returns to God returns to God incomplete. If you do we do we go to, to to paradise? Do we go to a place of waiting that is that is wonderful? No doubt. But the body seems to place great significance on the, the restoration, if you will, of the body. Not the flesh and blood body, but the body. For us to be clothed with a heavenly habitation. With heavenly clothes. Uh, I, I find that interesting. Um, that that there, there is so much. Just look at it sometimes and see how much emphasis is made of the, 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 the body being raised from the dead. Why is the body, why does God bother? I mean, if, if we're already with God and you know, our soul is with Him, why in the world do we need to come back with, with Jesus and receive that resurrected body? Because for some reason, it is important. It is important that we be body and soul complete. A couple of things strike me, like in verse 4, he says that mortality may be swallowed up by life. It kind of reminds you of 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul talks about mortal will be changed into immortality. And then it just occurred to me while you were talking, John says, we don't know what we're going to be like in, the, in that resurrected body. We don't, but it will be like whatever Jesus has. And, and I think that fits with what you were saying, that there's an importance there to a complete uh, situation in that eternal body. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's just, that's just food for thought that, that we, need to, we need to have the same keen desire that Paul had to be clothed with a body, but a body so much better than this body that does not get weak, that does not fade away. Yes, sir? I think it's interesting, too. When we're young, we're pretty comfortable in a tent, you know, we sleep on the ground, take the different temperatures, and it's, it's, it's good. But when you get older, you sure don't want to be in one. Absolutely. 
<laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. The, the, the older we get, the harder it is to live in a tent. <laughs> no, no doubt about that. Um, yeah, I used to, used to love the idea of camping now. It just, it, it would wear me out just thinking about going on a, on a camping trip. Anybody else? Okay, so we groan in this tent, he says in verse 4. We're burdened in this tent. Uh, he says, not because we just want the, the old body gone. We do want that. That's not all we want. That's not all we're hoping in. But further clothed. We want something different than this. We want that something that's more glorious, that is immortal, uh, that is, that is sown in weakness and raised in strength. We want that body, that body that God has for us. And so our, I guess, making it more practical, our goal in life is not just to get life over with. Our goal in life is to reach a place that is so much better than this life that it's it's incapable of even measuring it. You ever known people who just they wanted life to end just because they were just tired of it and wanted to end, wanted it to end. I'll tell you the person who has that kind of attitude about life, when the challenges of life come, they're not going to hold up under them very well. I think it's one of the secrets of Paul. He's so keenly understood and desired that eternal glorious body that he was willing to go through anything he needed to go through to get it. And so there's your first motivation for Paul to receive that glorious body. He says in verse 5, Now he who prepared us for this very thing is God who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. I, I get really nervous, I guess, seeing these, this, these, this idea of the Spirit given as a guarantee as anything other than um, the spiritual gifts that God gave in the first century. The spiritual gifts that went along with the revelation of the Word of God it could be that he has something more than that in mind here. Um, but it, it seems to me that the best way to, to understand that God giving us the Spirit as a guarantee, um, the, what, what, what that is talking about is that the Word of God, the message that Paul is preaching, has God's stamp of approval on it in the spiritual gifts that Paul and these other people were, were able to perform. Now, it could very well be. And uh, if, if you believe this, I think more power to you on it. But it could very well be that he's talking about something a little bit more than that, a little bit different than that. Uh, that, that all that God has for His people, every spiritual blessing, that we have in Christ Jesus is kind of an earnest money contract on the, the, the eternal abode that we will have. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, my Bible capitalizes spirit, but I'm wondering like, what if we don't capitalize that, but it's talking about our spirit, our soul within us as that guarantee of eternity within us. Um, is it talking about the Holy Spirit, or is this just open to interpretation? I, I, I'm like you. I, I think we get ourselves in a pickle sometimes because when we see capital S, of course, you know, I'm going to say the S wasn't capitalized. Every letter was capitalized <laughs> in, in the first century Greek. Uh, and so there, there was no big S spirit versus little s spirit. So, so the context has to determine it. I, I think 
for me, the context here in this passage, even though I think we do sometimes see capitalist spirit more than we ought to, um, that's the way I read it. Uh, but again, that's one of those situations where I wouldn't be dogmatic. Mega, do you have your hand up? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, could very well be. I tell you, Romans chapter 8 is one of those passages where I don't capitalize the S near as much as the New King James Version translators capitalized it. Um, and I think Paul goes in and out of little spirit versus uh, big spirit uh, there. And... Um, you know, verse 23 is one of those that I think would fit probably either way, but I'm not sure you're not right on that, that, that it is what God has given here that, uh, that is a result of the Word. Uh, it's, it's not the Holy Spirit moving on us in some kind of a supernatural way. It is the, the Spirit's reaction to the message of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, could very well be that that what he's saying here in Romans 8 23 kind of is the same thing as as what he's saying here in, in 2 Corinthians 5. Thanks for that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so it's talking about, you know, the body and the spirit. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so it's talking about the body and the I'm sure it will. Yeah. The frailty of life. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, John Lennon, I don't think, was the first one that came up with this phrase, but he, he used someone else's phrase, put it in a song. Uh, life is what happens when we're busy making other plans. And that happens so often with people and, and stories like that with your brother happen day after day after day and it drives home how fragile life is and we need to remember that and and that needs to put the same uh, to, to instill the same zeal in us that was in Paul to whenever that day comes to be found right in the sight of God anybody else Okay, verses 6 through 8. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So he says we have this, this confidence. We're always confident that even though we, we are in a tent Away from home right now, home is where we are headed. And that needs to be the confidence of every single Christian. Again, it's one of those situations where if, if, if you're doubting, you know, if, if you're saying, man, I did, I don't, I'm not sure I'm going to make it. 
you probably won't, won't be able to go through something like Paul went through and keep your faithfulness to God intact. You have to have that confidence. And if you don't have that confidence as a Christian, change it. Change your life. Change the way that you approach life so that you do have that confidence that if, like Holly's brother, your life was over in a split second when you were making other plans, you, you, you'll be ready. And you'll receive that heavenly home. He says we're confident that although we're away from home, we are going home. Uh, what's the old saying? Where is home? Where the heart is. Where the heart is. I think that's, that's what Paul is saying here in this passage. He's not home because his heart is not here. His heart's in heaven. His heart's with the Lord. His, his heart is with his Father. And so that is home for him. And he, he kind of makes the same point that he made in um, verse 18 of chapter 4. Verse 18, we look not at things that are seen, but things that are not seen. He says it like this in verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is what we see with our hearts. With his heart. Paul could see the Lord. He could see his father. He could see that heavenly home. And that's what made Paul, Paul, is that, that vision that he had of that eternal life and that desire because of that vision, the desire that he had to leave this temporary shelter to go and to be with his Lord. Verses 9 through 11, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God. And I also trust we are well known in your consciences. Now he's been talking about faith, that we walk by faith. What in the world is he doing throwing? things that we do in there. I thought salvation was by faith and not by deeds. There's a question in there. <laughs> James explains it. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Uh, the, the, the great passage on the necessity of continued obedience to Jesus Christ and in, in that continued obedience showing to God that faith, that quality of faith that will result in the <coughs> salvation of our souls. And he says over there in James, uh, too, that um, uh, it's not just about talking about it. It's about doing it. It's one thing to say, yeah, boy, I've got faith. Uh, i got faith that could move a mountain. It's another thing to start trying to move those mountains. And uh, we, we, have to, we have to back up the words with the action. Paul, despite what men might teach, he never saw any kind of um, any kind of clash or any kind of, of contrast, if you will, between faith and obedience. He never saw that as a problem. For him, faith was like James. Faith was always something that went hand in hand with obedience. Obedience proves faith. Um, 
And so he says that, that his goal, because he wants God on Judgment Day to declare his faith genuine, he is striving to the best of his ability in everything that he does to be pleasing to the Lord. And what he says there is that's what we have to have as well. It's the attitude that we have to have. It's, gonna, it's, it's faith that, that moves to action and action that proves faith. Why? Because just like Paul, we're going to stand before God. We're going to be in, in front of His judgment seat. He says we're going to receive the things done in the body according to what He or we have done whether good or bad. There's a day coming when we'll stand before the Lord and we'll either hear, hear well done, good and faithful servant and enter into that home prepared for you or we will hear depart from me you workers of iniquity. And in verse 11, this loving God that He has described to us, this God that so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that so many people want to focus on exclusively. He describes Him as the Lord of terror. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Knowing that we're going to stand before God on the day of judgment and that that is for the unrighteous a very terrifying prospect. He says, knowing the, 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 that God is worthy of being feared if you're not ready on judgment day, He says, I go out and I try my best to persuade men to do what? To be faithful to the Lord. What is it that's motivating him to go out? Well, he knows the love of God. And he's going to talk about that in just a moment. But he also knows the terror of God. He knows that we can behold both the, the, the goodness and the severity of God. Goodness to those who do good, severity to those who practice wickedness. He said, we persuade men, but we are well known to God and well known to you too. I think his point there is that you know, he's, we, we've already seen it, that he has his detractors there in Corinth. People are saying, uh, he, he's, he's in it for the wrong reason. He's got the wrong motivations for this. He's not like us. And so you need to reject Him. We haven't approved Him. And so you need to reject Him. What He says is, God knows me. And God approves of me. And who else knows Him? Corinth knows Him. Again, we remind ourselves, this is not Paul's first contact with Corinth. He has spent a year and a half with these people in his second missionary journey. He is intimately, he may know these people more, better than he knows the Christians in any other church except maybe for Ephesus. He knows these people. And these people know Him. And so, even though the critics may give Him a tough time, He said, God knows me. He knows my motivation. He knows why I'm out persuading men. And you know it too. In verse 12, For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. But if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are of sound mind, it is for you. 
For the love of Christ compels us because we judge this, that if one died for all, then all died. And He died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for Him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. Okay, we don't commend ourselves again to you. He has, and he doesn't, Paul does not like tooting his own horn. Um, there is a necessity of it for him to tell people who he is and what motivates him and to, to assure them that God is with him in what he is doing. And it's, it's kind of like he says here, you know, I, I hate to bring it up again. Something that you should already know. But here's what I'm hoping to give you. When those critics come and they say, oh man, Paul's in it for what he can get out of it. He's, he's in it for the money. He's in, in it for the power. He is in it for the prestige. Notice, ever notice that people who who approach life like that are always good at accusing others <laughs> of, of approaching life like they they project on others what they feel themselves you have people who have come behind paul to corinth and they are muddying the waters and they're doing it for their own benefit they're doing it for for either financial gain popularity gain or whatever that's what they're accusing Paul of here. What Paul says to them is, I'm telling you what I'm telling you about my relationship with God and with Jesus Christ and what motivates me. Because I expect you to answer these people when they, when they begin to badmouth Paul. He wants to give them the ammunition that they need to, to, to um, defend Paul, not because Paul is Paul, but because Paul is preaching the gospel of Christ. And again, as he has told him before, when you see that I am genuine, you see the message is genuine. And that's what Paul wants to know. He doesn't want anybody's minds turned by these people because they don't know how to answer. And so he says, here's the answer that you give to those people. Yes, sir. I think Paul's motivation was his focus upon the reward at the end, just like ours should be. And that allowed him to meet all these challenges he did. Yeah, his motivation is victory. Yeah. And it's victory for these people as well. Um, evidently, one of, the, one, one of the things that they were saying about Paul is, that guy's crazy. And uh, what's Paul's answer to that in verse 13? First part of verse 13. Yeah. I'm crazy for God. Is <laughs> what he's saying here. Uh, the reason those people don't understand Paul is because they're not like him. And the reason they're not like him is because they're not, they don't have the same zeal for God. What they see that they're thinking is this lunatic that's out of his mind is a man who is on fire for God. And but he says that these things that I am teaching you that other people say, my detractors say, are I'm, I'm a lunatic. He says I'm saying what I'm saying because it's true and because you need to hear it the salvation of your soul. 
And then he adds that other motivation. One motivation is the terror of the Lord. Here in verse 14, it is the love of Christ. The love of Christ compels us to take this gospel message to the world. Jesus died for all. Now, um, in, in, the, in the lesson book, I, um, I explained this in a way that I'm not sure I agree with now. <laughs> uh, I, I always reserve the right to change my mind. <laughs> and um, what I referred to more in, in, in uh, the, the lesson outline book was Galatians 2 and verse 20. Uh, uh, this is, um, if one died for all, then all died. Um, what, what is the death there? Uh, I took the position in the, in the, um, in the, the, the outline that the death there is uh, dying to sin and dying to self. I'm not sure instead that what he's saying, and I reserve the right to be wrong a second time. You know, I was wrong once. That's when I thought I was wrong and I wasn't. <laughs> um, but it could very well be, and, I, and I'm leaning toward the idea that what he's saying here is that J Jesus Christ uh, that, that everyone died spiritual, uh, spiritually. Everyone has sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. And so who did Jesus die for? Everybody. He died for people in Corinth. He died for the Christians in Corinth. He died for the, those who have not yet obeyed the Gospel in Corinth. What is it that keeps Paul going on? What is it that you know, Paul never says, okay, that's enough. I've, I've started enough churches. I've, I've preached to enough people. I've converted enough souls. What keeps him from, from doing that? Oh, Christ died for everybody. And so the work is never done. If one died for all, that means that all died spiritually. He did die for everyone but there are some who live. And he says those who live, and he's talking, I think, principally about himself uh, here, but he's, I think he's saying me, and that's an example to you. We live so that we sh should no longer live for ourselves. Why? Well, there's a bunch of dead people out there that need to be spiritually raised from the dead. Christ died for them. And Christ died for, for everybody else just like He died for me. And so what ought to be my attitude? And I'll just tell you, I fall far short of this. And reading passages like this really convicts me. What ought to be my attitude? My attitude is because the, the world is dead. These people are out here living in sin that Christ died for. I'm going to make it my goal to teach as many of them as I possibly can. That's Paul's goal. At the beginning, we were talking about you know how do we continue on through suffering, and I think Christ or Paul says that to live as Christ, to die as gain, and that's understanding that his life no longer belongs to. Him belongs to Christ. What's interesting to me in verse 16 is that he had spent his whole life looking at Jesus in vain. And 16 is a beautiful passage because it's, it, he says, I no longer look at him that way. I now see him as much more than the man who lived and walked uh, that we saw. I see him as my Savior. Yeah, um, and, and I think in my understanding of verse 16, and we'll close it out there at verse 16. Um, he is describing himself before he came to know the Lord. And he said, what I saw was not somebody worth following. Why? He didn't have any power 
earthly power. He didn't have any earthly prestige. He didn't have any earthly wealth. Why should I follow him? He said, I'm not looking at Christ like that anymore. And I'm not going to look at people like that anymore. No longer will I look at any man according to the flesh. And the point he's making is, you don't either. And, you know, they evidently have this same kind of uh, problem that, that James deals with in the first part of James 2, of looking at the outside, looking at the tent, and making judgments about people. Paul said, I'm not doing that anymore. And you don't do it anymore either. Okay. That brings us to the end of our study tonight. We'll start at verse 17 in our study next week. Um, Blake, lead us in prayer. We'll be dismissed. The Lord who is in heaven, we thank you for this time we've had to come together, Christians like precious faith. To open up your word, to be inspired, to know your love for us, to see the example that Jesus gave for us, to hear Paul's words describing how we deal with hardship, how we deal with the trials of this life, and understanding the confidence that we have in you, knowing that you are faithful to deliver us when our body fails, and we return home to you. Help us to look forward to that day, Lord. Help us to not be too comfortable here, complacent in this life, but help us to see people the way that your son did, to see their souls, to see the eternal life that lives within them, and to bring them to you to show them the hope that we share because of your son. Help us in this way to reach people and to share your love and be with us as we go through the remainder of this week. Help this to be on our hearts and in our minds as we interact with coworkers, friends, and even family. We love you, Lord. And we ask that you continue to guide us and protect us. And please forgive us of all the sins that we have committed against you. We pray these things through your son Jesus' most holy name. Amen.